I'm Ron McClure. Uh, I teach bass and composition at NYU. I've been here for about 15 years. Uh, I've been teaching for about 30 years. I taught at the Berklee School of Music in 1971-72, and I've been doing various and sundry things other than making a living playing the bass. And, uh, I play some piano, not like the last gentleman you just had, but uh, <clears throat> I'm a composer, arranger, and uh, a freelance bassist. I live in New York because there are more possibilities here than probably anywhere on earth. Uh, I've been very fortunate. I mean, I graduated from Hart College of Music in Hartford, Connecticut with a Bachelor of Music in Bass, Double Bass, which that and $2 would get you on the subway. Uh, <coughs> But I moved to New York and I started playing with, uh, you know, Herbie Mann. Buddy Rich, I think, was actually the first band that I played with, a big band. And I went out to Las Vegas and played with him with Sweet Edison, Sam Most, Mike Mineri, Micah Benny. Uh, uh, then I came back to New York and uh, joined Charles Lloyd's quartet with Keith Jarrett and Jack DeJunet, which I spent four years with. And that was in the 60s, from 66 or 69, basically. And uh, we traveled all over the world. We were the band of the year in 1967. Got my cover, picture on the cover of Downbeat magazine. And that was very exciting because uh, it was a, a real departure. Oh, I forgot a, a very important uh, relationship betwe between those two. I played with Wes Montgomery and Whitten Kelly trio with Jimmy Cobb for a couple of years. Uh, that was amazing. I just happened to be playing with Maynard Ferguson's band in, uh, in, uh, in Atlantic City and Paul Chambers, who was ill and actually dying at that point, couldn't be found. So Jimmy Cobb went bang, bang, bang on the snare drum and came up and said, come up, you know, because the whole band, of course, was sitting there waiting to hear Wes Montgomery. And so I went up and I played with them and Wes turned around and like smiled. And uh, the next time I saw them, they were playing at the Village Gate and Ron Carter was playing with them. And uh, he, uh, he was late, so they said, well, can you play the first set? So I did, and uh, the next night Ron Carter called me and said, well, I'm doing a record date, I'm going to be late, so can you play again? I'll give you $20 if you play the first set. And I said, yeah, sure. You know, I was playing with Charles. And that time they took my number, and then a, you know, a month or so later, Witten called me up and asked me to join the group. So we went out to the West Coast and played Shelley's and all these great things. And they were wonderful. I mean, they were the nicest people I ever worked for. And uh, I mean. I've never heard anybody swing as hard as Winton and Jimmy and West. That was amazing, <laughs> amazing experience. Uh, and then I went with Charles Lloyd, which was the complete opposite. I mean, that was like Freedom and Keith Jarrett and Jack DeJunet. I mean, I really didn't know what to make of that for a while, you know. Uh, in the 70s, I played with Blood, Sweat and Tears and the Pointer Sisters, and uh, I started writing. Uh, I got a Grammy nomination in 1975 for a piece I wrote called No Show. And when I was teaching at Berkeley, I used to write No Show in the space if a student didn't show. So I wrote No Show on a piece of manuscript paper and I wrote a tune and got me a Grammy nomination. Um, I'd like to tell people I was graminated for a NAMI and uh, that usually goes over their head. But, uh, you know, I've been writing ever since. I've done many projects with uh, big bands uh, of my own, which have never been recorded. I have about 18 of my own CDs and Steeplechase and Axis Jazz and EMP and uh, various things. Um, I started teaching in New York uh, when I came back here after being in California until 1973. Uh, lived out there for a while and uh, played with Lee Konitz and Vince Caraldi and all these the people that came out there. I was kind of like a house bass player in certain places for a while. But New York pulled me back and, uh, and then I played with Dave Liebman's band for a long time. And I'm still playing with Quest. As a matter of fact, we just played in New York at Birdland uh, a couple weeks ago with Richie Byrack and Billy Hart. And we're going to Europe uh, on the 20th of this month, October 2005. And uh, we're going to record again in, uh, in Europe. It's pretty amazing. We haven't played in 14 years, so we're back together. That's probably the most adventurous group that I've ever played with. Uh, you know, I got to play with people like Paul Blay. And I, I played with Thelonious Monk for a while. That was great. He never really talked to me very much. But uh, one night I played a Bode solo in, uh, at the Aqua Lounge in, in Philadelphia. I think I was the only white person within 10 blocks. And the place was going crazy because, you know, there's this white kid playing with the bow, you know. And, uh, and, and the next day he came up to me and he hadn't said a word to me in six months or whatever long it was. And he said, uh -huh, can you leave the bow alone? And I almost died. I almost had a stroke right there and it fell on the ground. And uh, I said, yeah, sure, Monk, why? He said, ah, the sound, you know, that was, that was it. I mean. And I actually got to play with uh, Miles Davis, uh, the Vanguard. Herbie Hancock called me on a Saturday night at 8 o'clock. Can you play the Vanguard at pace uh, 3750, Union scale, 8 o'clock. Who cares? I'm going to play with Miles Davis. I show up, Joe Henderson, Tony Williams, Herbie Hancock, and Wayne Shorter. No Miles. Didn't say a word to me. Nothing. No, 
no music, no words. This one just started to play, you know, and uh, so I started to play too. Have no idea to this day what we played if they were playing tunes. By that time, that was the late '60s. I mean, all the plug nickel records were out. So when you heard what they did with the standards that they played, and they took them on trips like we did with Charles Lloyd, we would we'd play Forest Flower by Charles Lloyd and take it completely out. I mean, every night we were so tired of playing the same tunes. We, necessity being the mother of invention, we you know, we played something else every time. But I've had a ball, you know, I mean, uh, I can't really complain about uh, the experiences I've had. I was in the right place at the right time a lot of times. And, uh, I can swing. Uh, I hear very well. I play some piano so I understand what people are doing. Uh, I'm pretty easy to work with. I'm willing to play. I play the music that's, I play the cards that are dealt. I play the music that I'm listening to, uh, I'm playing at the time, and try to find a way to make it work. I did that with Charles Lloyd, uh, you know, Cecil McBee was the bass player and he and Keith had some friction between them apparently, I don't know what that was, but uh, uh, I came in and kind of created my own space in that band like I did with the uh, Quest with Dave Liebman because George Mraz and Eddie Gomez had been bass players with that band and they, you know, they play a lot of pedal point, a lot of dissonant, they don't play like standards, you know, per se, where they play standards, but not in the same style that Tommy Flanagan would, for instance, or Bill Evans, who they played with. So, uh, I mean, things go different ways. And I've had a lot of different experiences. Uh, you know, I've played electric bass with rock bands, Pointer Sisters, Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and uh, people like Blay, I mean, Monk. So I, I think that I'm you know, more uh, eclectic than some people. And, uh, and I enjoy that. I enjoy the differences. I like to vacillate from one style to another. And, uh, you know, but and still I have that Wynton Kelly kind of time feeling when I like to do that. And people, uh, People do like that. I like to play whatever I think is appropriate. I like to play people that have that kind of time as well. I mean, that, that never gets old for me. But, uh, I'm also a composer. I mean, I, I've, you know, I do a lot of writing. I've always, since I was a kid, I, you know, I, I, always, I started on accordion. And then they told me that a gentleman was somebody that had an accordion but chose not to play it. And so, I, you know, then I started getting into, in high school, I started using the left hand as well as because the, the buttons were kind of a drag. And, um, you know, I always wrote tunes from the time I was about 15 years old, and uh, then I would get them played. Charles Lloyd played some of my tunes, and, uh, and then I got with Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and there were four horns, and there was you know, four rhythm, you know, and the overdub possibilities, doubling brass, you know, you know, the day Brars ran and played tuba, and he played, you know, trombone and bass trombone, and the horn players, the saxophone players played flute and clarinet, so I used all that. And, uh, I mean, I mean, I'm, I really am a student. I mean, I just, I just love to try things I haven't done before, you know. So uh, I think the writing really keeps me thinking about what, you know, what should I do now when I play? And I think that's part of, the, part of my success is, if I have any, you know, trying to find something that works with the music instead of just playing, trying to imitate Paul Chambers, which I did for the first half of my life. <laughs> so Paul was your hero. Oh, one of my major heroes, yeah. And I took his place and uh, that was an honor. I mean, I. I played opposite him for six weeks at the consulate hotel, and uh, he was pretty hard to talk to. You know, I was trying to tell him how much I appreciate it. He said, oh, no, you're the cat, you're the cat. You know, he just go go, leave me alone, you know, basically. What, what was it about him that made him so special? His, oh, he played the bass beautifully, but his time. I mean, uh, Dave McKay, a blind pianist from L.A., told me, you know, listen to four on uh, working Miles Davis, 1956. I mean, the way Paul played the quarter note, it was just the way he walked. I mean, it was exhilarating, just the way he played time. His solos, uh, I mean, Chuck Israel called him the uh, Louis Armstrong of the bass, I think, because I mean, they're very predictable solos. But, but great, he played with the bow. I mean, he changed directions of the bow on every note, which is really hard to do. I mean, I don't know if anybody else who really played as accurately and as consistently great as he did in that time. And he was the first to do that, really. And, uh, and also, I, I, I like the music he played, the association, like especially Miles. You know, Red Garland, Philly Joe, you know, those people. I think that a lot of why I like certain players is because of the music they play. You know, and uh, there's a lot of great players that the music doesn't affect me, so I, I may not pay as much attention to them. But I like the warmth that the, the players that played with Miles, especially in that period in the 50s and 60s. The one thing I think is missing in, in jazz today is apprenticeship. And if one thing that, this, that I had was the ability to apprentice people like that. And, uh, you know, I mean, they would say little things like while we're playing even, they, they would, you know, they would mention, uh, Herbie Hancock came up to me uh, after I played that time with Miles like this. He said, in this band, we strive for lightness. 
I mean, I was molesting the bass because I was terrified. I mean, I didn't know what we were playing. There was no music and nobody had talked to me. And I'm suddenly I'm playing with my favorite band, the greatest band of all times. And there's Joe Henderson in it, too. And Miles Davis stays home for some reason. And there I am. And I'm clueless. And it's a packed house on a Saturday night at the Village Vanguard. And I'm like 24 years old, whatever I was. And uh, when he came up to me like that, I mean, I was hanging on every word, you know. And I asked... Uh, you know, I asked uh, uh, Wayne Shorter where I should go. I was, I was thinking about getting out of New York, and he thought for a minute. He said, "Africa." Okay, I, I got your point. You know, uh, <laughs> but when Herbie said that to me, I realized that. Uh, I mean, when you listen to those Miles Davis records, I mean, they play so light; they don't bash. I mean, uh, Joe Henderson played so soft. You stand right next to him, you can hardly hear him. I worked with him a, a number of times, four different times in the over the years and uh, I was standing right next to him I couldn't hear him but he sounds gargantuan on records and most of the good recording musicians do seem to have a compact sound and they're not screaming so I, I learned something from that I mean about how to play the bass I mean you don't play the bass beyond where it sounds good I mean, make them come to you as Stan Getz told me I was playing with Stan uh, uh, one night and we were playing in Chicago at the with Jazz Showcase or someplace and uh, he came up and he was messing with my amp you know I had this big and they finally just turned it on and he went, you don't need it. And he said, make them come to you. And I, I remember that. And uh, Mel Lewis told me, uh, it's a little loud, isn't it, when I subbed for Dennis Irwin with the big band. He said, well, if you, play, you know, if you play loud, then you make them play harder and it affects the balance of the band. And the trombone players start working hard and the time starts to slow down. It just messes up the whole balance, you know. And uh, Keith Jarrett said, uh, along the same lines, he said, I want to hear more of you and less of your amp. Um, which, I mean, little things like that, I mean, really can, I mean, just divert your attention for, for life, you know, I mean, uh, nothing major about, like, you know, you, you know, like you really stink and you should take lessons. Nobody ever said anything like that, that yet. I mean, it's, there's time. One of the main things is uh, to, to remain healthy. Uh, you know, I, I'm a tennis player. I'm, I always like sports. And, uh, you know, I quit drinking a long time ago and I don't do anything like that anymore. Which I, I did, you know, most of us did at some point. And uh, I tried to be more balanced. I, when I first started getting into music, I mean, I was addicted to it, and I, you know, it was 24 7. And uh, I think a lot of musicians get, a lot of people get too wrapped up in one, wear one hat. I like to tell my students I like to wear a lot of different hats, you know, because I like to play different ways. I like to play different music. That's why I live in New York, because I have a variety of things. In the next four days, I'm playing with four different complete musical. I mean, from Joe Giglio tonight at uh, 107 West to Jeremy Steig at the St. Peter's Church on Monday. Jeremy Steig? Yeah. And he called me the other day, and uh, we're playing at the St. Peter's Church on, on Monday night with Vic Juris. And, uh, and I think that's it. I mean, I mean, I get stale if I stay with one band. I stayed with Blood, Sweat, and Tears about a year longer than I should have because the money was nice. It wasn't as good as most people think it might be. but. Uh, I mean, it was a salary, and I was work, working, and we get paid if we worked or not, and I was kind of comfortable, you know. And uh, that can be the death. I mean, I think I'm, I function better if I'm a little uncomfortable. I like to be a little hungry and uh, feel like there's a chance of something miraculous happening because, uh, I mean, familiarity kind of like, after a while, people fall into routines where, even with Winton, they played the same tunes forever, and Jimmy Cobb, and went and played the same tunes that they played with Miles. And uh, Jimmy Garrison said for me one night, and he told him, uh, you guys going to play the same tunes the rest of your life? And they, they said, you know what he said to me, man, you know? And I said, well, went, you know, it you know, would be nice to, you know, to move on. You know, I, I'm always interested in what's coming next. I, mean, I want to do something I haven't done before. That's what keeps it fresh, I think, for me. Well, first of all, I don't have a method. People ask me what my, what my direction is, what my method is, and I say straight ahead. And I say, well, Show me some. I, I like to see what, where they're coming from. I, I mean, I can go out and listen to a band or watch somebody play, and I could tell you a whole lot about them in seconds, just from watching the way their body language looks and just how the sound they get and you know, how they approach their instrument. It's the same with a student. Um, a lot of them have expectations. They think you're going to teach a course, like out of a book, you know, A, B, C, page one, page two. Um, uh, depends on, on what their level is. I, I have a lot of very, very elementary students here. Right now, I have a beginning electric bass player and a drummer who's like plays rock and roll, and I'm trying to get him to teach him how to play jazz time. You know, he's going one, two, three, one, two. and I'm saying this like one, two, three, four, and he's going one, two, three, four. So I mean, I mean, I deal the cards again that I've dealt, and uh, I've had some advanced students. I think my first bass student at, at 
at Berkeley was uh, Jeff Berlin. He came in and played a Bach cello suite on the electric bass. And I said, oh, thanks. Uh, never saw him again. So, I mean, there are some people you can help, and there are certain things you can teach and certain things you can't. I mean, I try to bring them up to date uh, with, uh, they're listening. A lot of people have started with Jaco Pistorius, for instance. And I uh, mentioned Ron Carter, Paul Chambers, Scott Lafaro, Red Mitchell, Red who? Yeah, and they're going like, you know, so I'm saying, well, you have to listen, you know. To, I try to, that's why I like to teach in my apartment, because I can play them records and, you know, maybe even burn them a copy or something so they can, because they haven't really had the experience of listening. I mean, that's really where you get it, I think. That's how I learn how to play, from listening and then playing with people, rubbing shoulders with people who played a little better than you. And, uh, so basically, I, I try to find out what, where they're coming from, and I, you know, and then I just get an idea. Like when I'm playing jazz, I mean, I hear something, and I say, okay, I'm going to play this. And uh, I don't have a method. You know, I have no idea. Like I heard Gary Peacock say in an interview recently, Fred Stone, a former student of mine at Berkeley, sent me an interview with Gary. He said, "There's nothing I don't want to say, and there's nothing I do want to say." I thought that was good. <laughs> So I kind of feel that uh, that way too. It's really up in the moment, and uh, I, have, I often forget to give them assignments because I figured they should assume that what I've said should lead them somewhere. But I've found out that you really have to give them things to do, even if they're not going to do it. So um, teaching is very much like playing jazz to me. Uh, I've had a lot of people say, "Should you know, should Johnny go into music?" You know, and I say, "Well, if you have to." Because I mean, it's, it's a calling. I mean, if you don't have to, I mean, do something else because uh, it's too hard and there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee that you're going to get anywhere in this, even if you're among the best. I mean, a lot of great music goes unheard and unrewarded. And uh, then there's a lot of trash for cash that is hugely successful, you know. And I also tell them there's always room at the top, you know, and anything's possible, but it's, it's really up to your commitment and, uh, and putting yourself in in harm's way, more or less, putting yourself in, that's why I moved to New York, because if I had stayed in New Haven, I would probably be, you know, driving a cab and playing at the Midtown Motor Inn or something on Friday nights, you know, and not much more. So you have to, you have to go after it and, um, and you get as much training as you can and to apprentice, I mean, meet, you know, you have to be aggressive. You have to go out and, and let people know what you want to do. And uh, musicians are wonderful. You know, when I came to New York, I mean, People like Wynton Kelly and Wes Montgomery, Jimmy Cobb, and uh, I mean, they were great. I mean, uh, they really helped me to, I mean, encouraged me. I studied with Hall Overton, and he was, and I said, well, I wrote some stuff, and you think this is good? He said, well, do you like it? And I said, well, yeah. I was, well, you like it, somebody else will like it. Just write, don't worry about that. And I studied with, uh, um, oh, I can't think of his name, bass, bass player, anyway. In the, I had, had all these teachers that were worried about technique and fingering and positions. And he said, I don't care if you use your big toe, young man. You need to play some music and just get and express yourself, get it out there. So, I mean, that really affected me because it gave me the freedom to, to trust myself. I trust my instincts. I mean, I trust my ears. And I, if I feel a certain thing, it, it, there's a very good chance that I'm right. I'm you know, wrong a lot of the time, too. And, uh, and I tell my students, that if you really feel like you want to do this, I mean, uh, you can do it. It's it's hard, but I mean, think of what your life would be like if you didn't try, you know? If you never tried to, to become a professional or be as good as you can be. You know, don't compare yourself to anybody else. I mean, if you can make a living playing music, to me, that's success. I'm, I'm hugely successful because I'm still doing what I've always wanted to do. I mean, my bank account may not reflect that, and uh, other people may think, Ron who? That's what Ron Carter calls me, is Ron who? And uh, at least he did once. And, uh, he knows who I am, believe me. And uh, I mean, I think about that. I mean, I said, well, if you really want to, I mean, try it. I mean, you can always fall back and do something else. I have a 35-year-old daughter that's going into pharmacology. She was thinking about becoming a marine biologist until she realized it paid twelve fifty an hour. And now she's going to go to school for four more years and, uh, and get a degree in pharmacology. So um, I said, well, go for it. That's what you want to do. The mo most important thing, I think, in uh, the good thing about my life is that I've always done something that I wanted to do, you know. I love playing tennis in the park. I don't care if I win or lose. I just like going out there and doing it. And I love to play music with a variety of different people. I get something out of everything. I mean, um, I told Jack DeJanet once that I, was, you know, I wasn't doing much. Oh, I'm just doing a little dumb gig. She said, there are no small gigs. They're all important. Everything is important. And I, that, that was one of those moments of epiphany, too, with, uh, like you asked earlier that changed me. I mean, I really take everything quite seriously and I try to, you know, 
bring that to, uh, I read a book by Robert Schumann and he said every professional should bring 85% of his best to the table every time. And uh, I try to remember those kind of things because there are times when you get real dark and you know, like, what am I doing this gig? Because, I mean, right now I have a gig uh, I share with a friend of mine. I, I play piano, solo piano at McDonald's down at 160 Broadway. I mean, it pays like miserably. I mean, but I mean, but it's so much fun. And it's in the afternoon. I play from noon till four, and I go down and I play my tunes. I play everything from Cole Porter to Kenny Wheeler. And uh, sometimes people like it. Sometimes people throw things. People throw ketchup at me now and then. But um, I'm a good catch, you know. But I mean, it's. I mean, the doing of it is the reward, and I try to convey that to my students too. That they, uh, you know. They do something that they really enjoy and they can get something out of. And uh, I think that's an important way to look at your life. Otherwise, I know a lot of people that do things that they retire. I think retirement is something you, you retire for something you really didn't want to do anyway. I can't picture myself retiring. <laughs>